Where's the best place to stand for this? Okay. I'm gonna just uh, be in the way wherever. It's kind of, kind of not facing towards your mouth. It's kind of on the side, so that it'll be okay. closer to your body. You can just stay behind this line. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Hi, so it's good to see everyone, and it's good to be here at B-Sides. I know it's the last talk of the day. Normally, I would see myself as a presenter, but I know I'm not that. The only thing standing between you and the after party is me. I'm a barrier. So I want to try to keep this talk interesting and informative to everyone. And to do that, I need you guys to be interested, involved. Any questions that you have, feel free to Raise your hand during the talk. I'll be happy to take those as we go and make this as much of a dialogue as a presentation because if you're just standing in front of an audience talking and you guys fall asleep, I'm not doing my job. So without further ado, I want to talk about attacking and defending full disk encryption. Uh, this is one of those topics that no one is really talking about besides me. And I'm kind of really surprised about that, because everywhere you look, you see encryption that's deployed across environments. Corporate security policies. All too often, you see we deploy security, we deploy encryption on all our laptops. The reason you see this often, you get the magical checkbox on your audit. You have full disk encryption. It's secure. The thing that is not often seen and is not often done is these implementations aren't tested. They aren't validated. How do we know that this magical encryption back black box just solves all our security problems? Plain fact is, it really doesn't all the time. And yes, my talk is attacking and defending. There are ways to attack full disk encryption, but there are also ways to defend it. So I want to start by bringing up everyone on the same speed, going over uh, full disk encryption, uh, then get to the attacking part of it, uh, talk about how we can break into these systems. And then also give you ideas about how to defend these systems and make them more secure. So uh, the part that you don't really care about, I am a security engineer at Hurricane Labs. I've uh, been there uh, two and a half years now. Uh, do everything from our project implementation to uh, assisting with pen tests for full disk encryption and anything else come, that comes up. Uh, the program says everything else, so I don't want to bore you with that. The thing that you actually really do care about is yourself. Uh, just to get a sense of the audience, how many of you in your organization in some capacity uh, deploy full disk encryption? It's good that you're here. Uh, and usually I see a good quantity audience that does that. How many of you use full disk encryption personally uh, in some capacity? Also good that you're here. Uh, other than laptops, how many of you use this full disk encryption on other systems, like desktops? Couple people. I'm seeing that more and more, which is good. Uh, when I first was thinking about this, why laptops, you know, it's easy. You walk in, you steal someone's laptop. Actually, when I was giving this talk at uh, CMU, I started off by someone went to the restroom. I took their laptop, and I made sure I had the undivided attention of at least one audience member until I gave that back. But desktops, we don't think of like uh, the IT crowd. You put the monitor, big CRT monitor, under your shirt and go on the bus. That's not how, you, if you're going to steal a hard drive in a desktop, how you're going to do it. You're not going to walk out the door with a desktop. A business machine, you open the case, you pop out the hard drive, no screws involved, slip it in a bag, walk out the door. You have the drive, you have the data. So there is definitely value to putting FDE on desktops as well. Does anyone put, a, put full disk encryption on servers by any chance? The case where I've seen that, and this might be the same for you, uh, data in transit, and not the transit of going over the network, uh, transit when you're shipping it from one data center to another, uh, where you want to prevent the server from getting intercepted and having that data retrieved. Is that something similar to what you guys do, or is it when it's booted up and running? OK. Uh, problem with having full disk encryption on servers otherwise is if they have to reboot, which happens when you're running operating systems. They, they do that for some reason. 
uh, they need to be able to pre-boot authentication or pre-boot authenticate a lot of times, and you have to do that in an out-of-band method. Most of the time, if you're going to attack a server, uh, they're not going to be people running into your data center and carrying out servers. If that's happening, you have bigger issues than full disk encryption. But if people are trying to get into your data center, they're going to exploit web apps. They're going to exploit the applications running on the servers, not necessarily try to take the servers themselves. It could still happen, though. So, like any kind of technology, whenever we introduce a technology into an environment, it introduces additional challenges. Full disk encryption is no exception whatsoever. And we have quite a few challenges that are introduced, management being a big one. Not only do we have hardware that we need to manage, not only do we have operating systems and applications, we now have this magical encryption layer that we jam in between your hardware and your operating system that performs the encryption function. Now, that just doesn't happen. You have to be able to manage that. You have to be able to administer it. And who gets to do that? The security team and your system administrators. Woohoo! They really like to have more work to do. Just like that, anything that requires management is an overhead. There are also additional overheads associated with full disk encryption, such as performance implications. This is less of a problem anymore because processors have gotten faster, disks have gotten faster, you're seeing SSDs deployed. Uh, CPUs, they have encryption coprocessors now. Uh, but I remember back when, uh, maybe eight, ten years ago, when full disk encryption was really just like this brand new thing that companies were starting to push out. I was working for a place that just deployed it on their laptops, and it slowed machines down horribly because of all the extra computation that was required. And the length that people went through to try to deal with these performance impl implications was kind of insane. I saw people that they'd boot up their laptops in the car on the freeway so that they would be loaded by the time they got into the office. If people are doing those sorts of things to try to circumvent your security, you're not really doing anything and accomplishing things with security. Once again, less of a problem now. Computers are, have gotten significantly faster in the past 10 years, so we don't see that happen as much. Also, kind of obvious, but encryption is designed to make data hard to recover. That being said, users really tend to get angry when all their data disappears and you tell them you can't get it back. So just because all your data is encrypted on a laptop doesn't mean that you shouldn't have any other copy of that data. Backups are still important. Uh, and it's even more important for information that is critical. And I think of this even in the case of like information that isn't all that sensitive, but still is something you want to keep around. Like keeping all of your family photos and those sorts of memories on a fully encrypted machine might not be the best approach. You probably want to have a backup somewhere else that you can guarantee that you can get to. Uh, that's kind of a flip side of the coin. What data do we really want to keep safe? What data do we want to be able to recover? And to go along with the idea of data recovery, computer forensics is impacted by full disk encryption quite significantly. Um, obviously, a lot of forensics involves trying to get files off of drives. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because it carries into the later part of the talk. Uh, but this additional layer of encryption is actually something that has been known to foil attempts for investigators to recover data and break cases. They can sometimes even know that the data that they need is on the drive or disk that is encrypted, and they're just not able to break that, and they aren't able to solve the case. I have these discussions quite frequently with forensic investigators where they do run into these, and it's a very real issue. To expand upon the forensic side of things, I want to talk a little bit about how forensics is involved, because it is relevant to this talk. Traditionally, forensics have all been about disks. A hard drive really is stupid uh, when it comes down to it. You have a hard drive that's just laying there. It has data on it. What would happen if I was a forensics investigator who wanted to take a look at this drive? I would take the drive. I would run it through. I'd make a clone of it. Once I have the clone of it and I take my MD5 sum and my MD5 sum of the drive I'm working on, I know that that's an exact copy. I can investigate that copy. I can try to recover data. At the end of the day, if my MD5 sum is the same, I can prove in a court of law 
that I didn't manipulate the data and my evidence is valid uh, to be accepted into court. Now, new technologies, obviously, full disk encryption are making that more difficult. Uh, another thing that's making that more difficult and something I'm actively researching is how solid state drives do that because they are a lot more intelligent than your stupid normal hard drive. But forensics has evolved uh, from looking at traditional disks to kind of like the gold mine of information, being the memory system in a computer. Uh, memory analysis is really becoming increasingly more important. And this was an interesting shift for the forensics industry uh, because you really had the gold standard of never modifying data ever uh, to where memory analysis is involved, you actually run into cases where you do need to modify the evidence in order to gain access to evidence. Uh, case in point being, to load a memory capture tool into memory, you are in fact modifying memory. Now, the interesting thing about a memory dump, there is things in memory that you would never be able to get anywhere else. Um, memory has no file system, so anything you're going to be looking at in a RAM capture is going to be either some form of text or you'll have to do a file carving method to try to pull data out of the memory system. That being said, if you log into an email account, that password's in plain text in memory and can be easily recovered if you have access to memory. Uh, so in the case of a forensics investigation, that is really useful information to have that you might never be able to find anywhere else. And that's really why talking to forensics investigators, people who are working in this field, if they have the ability to get a memory dump, they will always do it now just because it's so valuable. <coughs> Excuse me. What are the... <coughs> Ah, that water's attacking me. So, looking at full disk encryption, a lot of times what I see on various, various implementations of this, you guys have different compliance requirements. Some of you are going to be subject to HIPAA. Some of you are going to be subject to PCI. Some of you are going to be subject to some other three or four letter acronym compliance thing that I've never heard of, but I have to deal with it. <clears throat> what always happens in pretty much in any of these scenarios is you have some kind of auditor who's going to test your security and verify this. So what this audit report says has full disk encryption. And there's a line at the end. And what happens? The auditor sees that you have full disk encryption, and you get a check mark there. And that means you're good, right? Right? If you have a checkbox on an audit report, you're good. I'm not getting a lot of agreement from the crowd. I don't understand. Exactly. Now, that, and that's the problem that we see. A lot of times what we don't do, to quote Ronald Reagan, we don't trust but verify. We just trust that our systems are secure because we don't understand them and we don't understand how they work. And full disk encryption is probably one of the most difficult things to understand just because encryption is hard. It involves numbers and a lot of math to make things confusing. And Really, that's what encryption is doing under the hood. There are numbers and math involved. And a lot of times, the encryption isn't really the thing that's going to fail. It's the implementation. And that's what we look for to do uh, when we're trying to test these systems. Now, I asked at the beginning of this talk, how many of you have full disk encryption deployed? And it was quite a large chunk of the audience. Now, if someone were to take one of your employees' laptops that had your full disk encryption solution deployed, it was stolen. How many of you can confidently say that the information on that machine is safe? Seeing very few hands, one person. So why would you say that you can be confident? Just to make this fun. <laughs> OK. So. You tried to crack it yourself. That, that is better than what most people are going to do. So I applaud you for doing that. Uh, what I'm going to do is we can see at the end of the talk if some of the same techniques you used, and we'll see if you feel the same way. So, uh, but a lot of times, people are just not able to confidently say that they know that it can be secure. And that's what I want to really try to do as a course of this talk. So that brings us to the second part of the talk, the uh, the sexy part of the talk, so to speak, where I'm going to talk about attacking full disk encryption. Because if you're a computer security professional, you could break into stuff all day and give talks about it, and people are going to think it's cool. 
So this is the people think it's cool part of it. The plain fact is, when you look at encryption, breaking encryption is hard. Math is hard. There's numbers involved. We only deal with ones and zeros. So any of that advanced math is just way overhead. But the plain fact is, a lot of times you do not need to actually break the encryption. Realistically, uh, all of the commercial products are going to be using a very similar method for the actual encryption. You're going to be using some form of AES. If you're writing your own form of encryption, you're stupid because the people who are designing encryption algorithms that are tested are actually doing validated encryption methods. If I'm just someone who's writing an encryption algorithm on my own, it's going to be bad. It's going to be short-sighted. There's going to be things I overlook. It's not going to be well vetted. So from an encryption technology perspective, the things that are right now known to be secure, such as AES, and that could change at some point, uh, but that's really the best option for encrypting something. Uh, really, just like anything, you look for the weakest link. I like to think of an XKCD comic uh, that talks about trying to break an encrypted system. On the left side of the, co the comic, there's the option for, here's what the crypto nerd is going to want to do. They're going to spend millions of dollars on a supercomputer, uh, and they're going to try to throw all this computing power and try to break this algorithm. And it turns out, due to a hashing mechanism, they're not able to do that. Then you look at the right side of the comic, and what actually happens. Instead of spending millions of dollars on a supercomputer, they spend five bucks on a wrench. And they use that wrench in order to get the person to give them the password. And that's really what we face in security all the time. You can have million dollar solutions defeated by five dollar wrenches. Uh, and really, just like anything in security and anything in software, in one of the earlier talks, uh, one of the presenters was discussing with the developer about a problem they found in the software. Well, you weren't supposed to do it that way. Really, a lot of the vulnerabilities and flaws that are found in systems are when we do things the way that we weren't supposed to do it. Thinking outside the box, looking at things differently, uh, and ultimately succeeding in trying to get into a system that's protected. So I want to take you through story time with Tom. All of these examples that I'm going to give are based on actual tests that I've done for customers, based on actual products and solutions that were deployed in production environments. These systems were what their users were using, were implemented across their environments. None of this stuff was lab cases where I made something up. Actual examples. Intentionally, I'm going to be very product agnostic, not talking about individual solutions and generalizing this across all full disk encryption solutions, just so that we can kind of apply it to everyone's environment. Um, really, to set the scene on this, though, you have an encrypted laptop that's stolen. Generally, the way I like to start out with this is I have no idea what's going on for this. I have no idea what system is in play, what product's in use, what company the laptop's for, why it even is there. I know exactly the same thing if someone were to break into a car and grab a laptop. It's a laptop. And really, most of the time, that's about the perfect storm for encryption. You have a machine that no one knows about, there's no credentials about it, no details about the company, no username or password, the darn thing is shut off. Nothing in memory, nothing. With everything we know about full disk encryption, that should be secure, right? Show of hands, realistically, that should be secure. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, yeah. And most of the time, when I talk to the employees and I talk to the, uh, the people who are administering this system, they have no reason to believe that it's secure or insecure. And really, the solution for me trying to break into these things is forensic penetration testing. And I don't know if this is actually a thing, because I've kind of made it up and didn't find any real references to the internet before I started talking about this. Uh, but it's basically the idea of traditional penetration testing using forensics techniques. And there are two ways that I like to do these sorts of attacks. Uh, the first example being zero knowledge. That's where I know nothing about the environment, nothing about the machine. All the information I have to glean from the system is from the system itself. There's also authenticated testing, which you can use for testing different scenarios. For example, if I wanted to see 
what would happen if the machine was powered on and locked and someone stepped away for two minutes? That's a totally different scenario than a machine that's shut down and fully encrypted. Uh, but you have the option to do both. But really, whenever possible, if I can break them into a machine using a zero knowledge attack, all bets are off. So in these cases, I'm given a fully encrypted machine that's quote unquote stolen. And most of the time, the people who are running this, they have no reason to believe there's a problem. They're completely confident that the system is secure. And to be honest with you, when this project was first presented to me and the first time I did one of these tests, I thought my boss was crazy. Because you see all these cases where, just think that the, uh, the border, for example, there was a case several years ago where someone had incriminating evidence that was displayed on their machine as they tried to cross from Canada into the US. They powered off that machine, and it was fully encrypted. They had the drive. They knew there was incriminating evidence on the machine. The FBI threw all their computing power at it. I think they probably had the NSA involved about it. Uh, you can read about it on some website somewhere, I'm sure, uh, since that's all probably been leaked. But they threw all that computing power at it, and they couldn't get into it. So you're looking at that, FBI, NSA, and then me. They're probably a little bit better at this than I am, so how the heck am I supposed to break in? Well, that's what I'm going to tell you about. <laughs> to start this attack, the machine was powered off. I had no memory information that I could use. I had to rely on the disk. So I went ahead and created full disk images of the machine using a forensics write blocker. What that device does is it just makes sure that you have a duplicate clone of the drive and that no information is changed from your source drive to your destination drive. Yeah. Yeah. DD will do the same thing except it's not considered forensically sound. Uh, in the case, in the sense of it's possible that you could mess something up. With a write blocker, if you were to somehow flip your OF and your IF, it would not allow that to get rid of the disk. So, that, that's really the only difference. If you know what you're doing with DD and you can prove that, uh, it'll still get, be able to be accepted in a court of law. Uh, but I'm not a lawyer either, so don't quote me on that. <laughs> it Technically, it does the same thing. It's just a hardware device that makes it easy for someone who's not really you know, scared of the command line, that sort of thing. But that's, that's the accepted practice for a forensics investigation, which is why I'm doing it. So. Uh, but yeah, I, I can do whatever tool clone drives that exist. That, that's not something that's mandatory. Um, what I also did is that now I have two drives that are the same thing. Then I cloned that drive and made an image of it. So I have a scratch disk that I can do whatever I want to and a disk that I can still do everything. And I'm never going to touch the original copy, never boot up that machine. That way, I can always go back to a known good state or a known, at least, original state of the machine. One of the things I also do is some initial reconnaissance at this point. I take my clone drive, I throw it in the machine, I can boot it up. I can see maybe what products deployed. Might be able to see what operating systems deployed. I just gar garner some basic information about the machine. Also see, in this case, it's a standard laptop. You have your regular interfaces, your USB, your serial, your parallel, PCMCA, FireWire, nothing special, just a normal business laptop. In a lot of cases, though, there are some very interesting breakthroughs. Um, the first time I did this was probably one of the more complex attacks that I had to do because I actually discovered a period of time where there was a grace period for pre-boot pre -boot authentication. Now the way this worked was I powered on the machine and it wanted me to prompt for credentials. Since I had a decent idea of when the machine was last used just based on when it was given to me, I tried re-imaging the drive and changing the clock. Nothing happened. I kept on doing that for like a really, really, really long time. And eventually, getting to a certain window Something prompt on, prompted on the machine, instead of requesting me for pre-boot authentication, it said, you'll have to authenticate in the next two hours. And then I clicked OK, and Windows XP started booting. I'm like, well, that's neat. The plain fact is, when an operating system is running, there is decryption that's taking place. 
because CPUs and memory, they need to contain unencrypted data. Now, when the system was running like this, you no longer have to attack the full disk encryption anymore. You can focus on the operating system. Now that I have a running operating system, that's when this gets really awesome. I went ahead, since I had an idea of when I could boot the machine, I downgraded the memory in the system to really shave off the bulk of my haystack. Uh, because when you're looking for anything in memory, you want to try to make it as small as possible because memory is just not a nice place. Uh, and then what I did is I leveraged DMA, which is a technology called direct memory access. Uh, DMA gives you direct access to the lower four gigabytes of memory in the machine uh, using various buses on the machine. Uh, in this case, there was a FireWire port on the machine. And there's a tool called Inception that allows you to use a Linux machine to actively modify or control or dump the memory of a machine. Uh, the awesome part of Windows is it has plug and play. So you can just connect any sort of device in. It'll be like, yay, there's another device connected. And I'm going to load drivers uh, to let you talk to this. And the system's cool with it. It doesn't have a problem. You run the tool. I can dump memory from the machine. But more importantly, I can essentially search the code in memory that is responsible for validating password authentication in Windows. And you can just make that go away. You make the code that validates passwords in Windows go away, then you can type whatever the heck you want as an admin password, hit enter, and you're in. And just like that, you have full unfettered access admin to the entire machine. Now, to give you a sense of time frames on this, the first time I did this using the machine where there was a period of time for pre-boot authentication, it took a really, really long time. Another test I did with the single sign-on solution uh, that required you to authenticate along with Windows, it broke in in under 90 seconds. And a machine that was shut off, fully encrypted, that everyone said was fine. So these attacks can be done very quickly if you're familiar with how the technology is deployed. And you really, there is no knowledge of what you're doing because you're not making changes to the encryption. You're not really trying to break the machine. Someone can walk away and you're in. So a lot of times when I say that, people are thinking, whoa, 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 you broke encryption. No, I did not break encryption. Encryption did not fail. It's the implementation of the encryption that fails. And this is really one of those cases where you have what we always have to deal with in this industry, the balance of convenience and security. Someone, or some, some reason, there was a feature in a product that we decide that, you know, maybe we don't want our users to log in or have to authenticate every time they reboot. Seems like a nice thing. Why, why make them type their password twice? Single sign-on being another case. You don't want your users to enter their password twice. That case, that little small convenience step results in the complete breakdown of an entire system. And really, this was a complete zero-knowledge attack on both sides. I had no knowledge about the machines, and I'm pulling everything I need to do off of the machine itself. Also, since I made a clone of the drive in advance, I never changed that drive. I could be a nice thief. I could put the drive back in the machine, leave it somewhere where they'll find it. They can go ahead, and let's just say they are a company or an organization that's subject to some regulatory requirement where they have to disclose a breach. They could say, our machine was stolen, we recovered it, everyone's good. Because they could even, they could even analyze the machine and say, hey, the drive was never modified. Then, you know, the day after they put out that press release, I could dump their whole customer database on the internet somewhere on Pastebin. And they would have nothing to suggest that that was done. And that's where this is really powerful. Thinking about how all of these deployments that I've tested were actual production environments where these technologies were deployed. Uh, it kind of really makes you think about the possibility of breaking into systems that we think are secure. So now that I've scared everyone, I want to talk about how to secure this, because we have to deal with both sides. It's fun to break into stuff, but you have to be able to clean up the mess afterwards. First and foremost, you have to understand the vulnerabilities that we're dealing with. Just like any kind of security system. Um, I know we like to say that physical access is, isn't hacking, but realistically, the risks that full disk encryption 
face, and the, you're really going to be dealing with, with physical access. Uh, if you're trying to get into a system remotely, you're not really going to be dealing with full disk encryption. Unattended machines, obviously, uh, something that can be taken or manipulated in some way with the users uh, not knowing about it. Granted, if people are plugging in firewire ports into the side of your users' machines while they're typing on it, you, you probably need better users. And I can't help with that. But <laughs> unattended machines, very easy, very easy. We hear about laptops getting stolen all the time. So it definitely happens. Uh, there is more possibility for passphrases and decryption keys to be reco recovered from memory, but not something I've found necessary in a lot of cases. And then the further possibility of more memory resident information being disclosed uh, in addition to what I was doing. But going back to the whole idea of usability and security, I understand that it is hard to make things change in organizations. So some of these recommendations, they're things that can be done relatively easily. Um, you could go to work on Monday and really start driving the process to improve your systems. And I really encourage you to do that if you can. Some of the other recommendations I'm going to have, they're going to be a little bit more drastic and harder to implement. And you might receive some more pushback on, from that. And I understand not everything is going to fit every organization. So it's really important to take everything I'm going to suggest and see how it fits best in your organization. There's a couple key recommendations and some other ones that can be layered on top of that to really better secure these systems. Uh, but really, what you implement and what you do, it all comes down to you. But one thing that is not a suggestion, an absolute mandatory key, pre-boot authentication is not an option. You should never have a case where an operating system will load without authenticating the user, ever, if you're trying to secure a full disk encryption deployment. As I demonstrated in multiple pen tests, if there's any case that this could happen or an OS could load, uh, even if it's a small window that seems very unlikely to be found, it can be found. And in that case, that can render the whole system insecure. So absolutely, if you have a case where you're trying to secure your full disk encryption deployments, go ahead, make sure that full disk encryption, and make sure that pre-boot authentication is enabled, period, end of story. Now, one of the things that people talk about all the time is the vendors are saying, oh, we have this software-based full disk encryption. That's, that's annoying. You have to have software. We have self-encrypting drives, and they're magical, and they encrypt that data, and you never have to worry about anything. And I really hate marketing people, so uh, they always say those sorts of things. The problem with self-encrypting drives is they can often be turned into self-decrypting drives, really depending on how they're implemented. First and foremost, if you have a self-encrypting drive without an ATA or a hard drive password on it, it's worthless, because the only place the encryption is taking place between, is between the platters and the controller. I don't know about you, but when I try to use a hard drive, I am not looking at the platters. I'm plugging it into the computer and trying to use it. So if you have that sort of an implementation, all bets are off. Yes, it's encrypted on the platters, but that's basically worthless. Now, if you have it encrypted, or not encrypted, but locked with a password, all you really need to do to move that machine is change the SATA cable to a different machine. As long as the drive doesn't lose power, it's unencrypted. So SATA's plug and play, which is awesome. As long as you can lift that data connection, you have a self-encrypting drive becoming a self-decrypting drive for you. So they aren't the magical solution that the vendors want them to be. Just by a show of hands, uh, how many of you have used a FireWire port recently? I mean, I have, but very few people here. How many of you can suspect your users need to use FireWire ports, like, ever? How many laptops have FireWire ports? Like, all of them. So, really, the impact for disabling DMA interfaces across your environment is fairly small. Uh, yes, it's a little bit of a pain to deploy, uh, but most of the business laptops that you have have the ability to turn this off in the BIOS. Now. It's not just FireWire that's a problem for this. There's other interfaces that are DMA capable, Express Card, PCMCIA. Often those aren't really necessary either. So you think about it from the perspective of how many users you have and how many users have this interface enabled that don't need this interface enabled. If you get required that pre-boot authentication be used 
and you disable your DMA interfaces on the bulk of your machines to the point where the machine has to be turned off in order to enable a DMA password, which would trigger pre-boot authentication, you're really kind of eliminating most of the attack surface that I'm using for getting into these systems. Yeah? Uh, good question. Um, eSATA might be DMA, um, but tri primarily all this stuff is written for something that you can use to connect a different device to a machine. So you're not necessarily going to connect two SATA ports together on a machine. So I don't know, I don't know if there's a way that you could do that, uh, but if there's some way that you could have a, a SATA device that's connected to another computer that you could use to inject things into memory, it would totally work that way. But uh, yeah, I don't know if SATA is actually considered DMA. It might be, but because it's designed to access a bus, but that, that is a good question. Um, but by looking at deploying or disabling the, these interfaces, yeah, you're eliminating a lot of the attack surface and really resolving quite a few of the issues resolve, revolving around trying to get into fully encrypted systems. And most of these are relatively simple to implement and aren't going to resolve a lot, cause a lot of feedback or pushback from your users. Now, another one to consider is the idea of standby and hibernate and what they actually do. Standby it keeps running contents of memory preserved while the machine is essentially off. Hibernate is even more awesome because it writes everything in memory to disk. Hibernate could actually be an attacker's dream because you have a memory image that you could duplicate to another drive and just basically attack the machine forever until you get in. <coughs> uh, standby being a similar state where you can take the machine in a running condition. Now, there, I know there are a couple products that do require pre-boot authentication or at least have the option that can be turned on for pre-boot authentication coming out of Hibernate and Standby. If you have that as a possibility, absolutely turn it on. If not, you really need to consider if the value of having these technologies uh, offsets the risks. And a lot of times, it's really not worth it. There's also the management aspect. We're dealing with people, and people have a tendency to forget things, like their encryption passphrase. Now, various organizations have different ways to deal with this. Uh, one of the most secure methods is too bad. You, encrypt, you forget your passphrase, your data's gone. Uh, users don't like that for some reason. I, I, I don't understand. But one of the things that if you have a way to handle resets of this, it could be a challenge response method. It could be a master password. Uh, you're now opening your help desk up to social engineering type attacks. I've seen places where like everyone in IT knew the master reset password for a full disk encryption solution. What's the point of having full disk encryption if everyone knows how to get around it? That it's bad. Um, but there are places that have done that and there are vendors that use that solution. Uh, social engineering, obviously, if it's a challenge response, you rely on stolen machines being reported quickly so that you don't have to reset that account or provide the unlock key in the case of uh, having a machine that's stolen. Then there's also the policy issue. Uh, machines, they cannot be left unattended while powered on. Because, as I demonstrated in a pen test, even with the machine that's turned off, I was able to get into some of them in under two minutes. In under two minutes, that's perfectly reasonable for someone to walk away to go to the restroom, leave their computer locked, and have everything taken off, or at least sensitive information taken, using one of the DMA attacks. So really, this comes down to a policy thing, but if you are in an organization where there is actually a risk of people stalking your employees and trying to take information off of machines, uh, this is something that is very important. I know uh, talking to some people in government agencies where you actually are at a completely different level than most of us in the corporate area, um, they really they can't ever leave their machines unattended. Uh, some of the laptops like Toughbooks will let you actually pull out the hard drive and take it with you and leave the machine there. Obviously, the OS isn't running in that case. That might be the best way to deal with this. But really, it all comes down to what fits best in your organization. Finally, independent verification. Trust but verify, have your implementation tested. And really using the forensics 
penetration testing approaches that I talked about is really one of the best ways to do this. As a caveat, if you're having your implementation tested, don't have it tested by the software vendor who's selling you the product, uh, just because they might be a little biased on that. Have it tested by an independent third party, someone who's familiar with testing these sorts of solutions and looking for their vulnerabilities and understanding their weaknesses. So to kind of wrap things up here, uh, and then I'll open it up for any remaining questions, FDE, it's not bulletproof. It's, it's not this magical checkbox that solves all our data security problems. Yes, it's important. Yes, it's something we need to have. But it still needs to be secured like anything else. Uh, just like if you're going to put in a firewall with any, any rules, it's a router. If you put in a full disk encryption solution that just lets you into the OS, it's just something to slow down your machine without it actually giving you any more security. That being said, your actual failure of the encryption itself is fairly rare. Uh, companies are standardized in that, and encryption is generally pretty good. Uh, it's the external factors, the implementation te techniques, and the possible oversights in configuration that, just like anything in security, those are what we're successfully exploiting. And really important just to understand the risks, understand how these technology work, and go ahead and improve wherever possible. Uh, I gave a long list of suggestions, but realistically, to really eliminate a lot of the risks, just two of those are what you need to follow. And they should be two that should be pretty easily accommodable in most environments. So with that in mind, I'd like to open the floor up for any questions, and thank you so much. And for more information, you can contact me. I have like six Twitter followers because it's new for me. Uh, and uh, we also have a web page, hurricanelabs.com slash FDE, that talks about the whole process so that you can share with anyone that's interested. So thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, what was the self what setups? Uh, soft raid. Setup. Soft raid? Yeah. So such as a software like a software raid setup. Yes. Okay. Uh, and how how are you? T so the question is re in regards to software raid setups and how you're loading the operating system. Yeah. So when it comes for a password, are you loading numbs and sets? So this, that's a kind of interesting research area. In the case of the system that had the pre-boot authentication, like what the the uh, grace period for pre-boot authentication, it seems like there has to be some sort of mechanism that's allowing that to be circumvented, or at least allow it storing some some form of something like a token or maybe even a password in there. That's something that's definitely something that can be researched more. Uh, depending on how this is implemented. Um, that's the kind of solution where I think we have the biggest risk of there being a problem with that implementation. Uh, some of the other systems where it's tied in maybe into a TPM or something like that, that's going to be harder to break the pre-boot authentication component of it. Yep. Anyone else have questions? Well, with that taken care of, I appreciate your time. And now you can go ahead and enjoy the after party. Have a good night, everyone.